on the spot chairpersons of the gcc chapters organizing this webinar respected dignitaries esteemed members of the profession my colleagues and all attendees of today's webinar good afternoon to you all i am c ashwini savrikar chairperson of the muskat chapter of icai and it gives me great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to you all for today's webinar by the very knowledgeable and eloquent speaker shri mohandas pai on a very pertinent topic new india post covid 19 this year we have seen unprecedented circumstances with covid 19 which has and is having and will have long term implications on how we live how we do business how we travel just every aspect of our lives has been affected and affected in a significant manner hence this question is in everybody's mind what will happen when things open up will it be normal will it be a new normal and what will this new normal be like speaking specifically about the gulf we are looking at cases of people losing jobs and these indians are going back to india so what's in store how is our country india coping up to this covid-19 situation and what's going, what is it going to be uh, living in this post covid situation this and many other discussion many other points will be discussed in today's topic and i'm sure everybody is looking forward uh, to our shri mohandas pai addressing us on this topic so to begin i request uh, ca neeraj ritolia uh, to please take over and uh, introduce our very eloquent speaker he doesn't need an introduction but uh, to do the honors please uh, ca neeraj thank you ashwini uh, you rightly said that uh, the spy ji doesn't need an introduction uh, my name is neeraj ritolia chairman of abu dhabi chapter and i am honored to introduce today's speaker tv mohan da is a rank holder fellow member of institute of chartered accountants of india properly known as mohan born in a beautiful garden city of bengaluru in a career spanning over 5 years ca mohan das pai has served in the areas of finance accounting information technology human resource education corp education corporate governance social impact innovation environmental conservation policy formation heritage preserve, preservation philanthropy and venture and startup ecosystem mohan has promoted a number of startups in india and those who are into this business they please contact him separately mohan is currently the chairman of rn capital 314 capital manipal global education a member uh, member of the board of hables india member of the board of governance of national investment and infrastructure fund chairman of the regulatory and technology committee and primary market committee of sebi and yesterday he was appointed chair of the insolvency and bankruptcy board of india he is a founder trustee akshay patra foundation the organization which provides lunch in school feeding about 1.8 million students every day and have fed more than 6 crore 60 million meals during the current covid 19 situation i would urge all the members to contribute to this noble cause akshay patra foundation he was awarded the padma shri award by the president of india in 2015 and the karnataka rajyotsava award in 2004 cm mohan was previously the board member of board member and cfo of infosys sebi board member of sebi national stock exchange of india is a trustee of international ifrs foundation chairman of fiki skill committee and higher education committee and few other organizations mohan holds a bachelor degree of arts and law is married to kusum lata and has two sons pranav and siddharth now i welcome sri mohan das ji to please address our members Uh, folks thank you very much for inviting me and uh, i find it very fascinating that we have people from all over the gulf joining together and this is the beauty of technology i think covid 19 has forced us to change our habits and use technology more and more and i find it fascinating that is happening all around the world now when we analyze covid 19 and try to see what the future holds for us we need to understand that possibly for the last 100 years This is the first time such a large part of the world has been impacted. We had the first world war, second world war, 
where 16 million and 60 million people were killed and it changed the world order. But that was, compared to what it is today, a lesser impact geographically, even though more, more people suffered mortality. But today we can see about 150 countries. There weren't 150 countries then, but in terms of sheer geography, this has had a bigger, bigger impact. And the sad thing is nobody knows when this is going to end, whether there's going to be a cure. Because right now there is no cure, and that is what is causing the concern. So today we're seeing a unique situation where one small invisible virus has brought the greatest countries to his knees. And everybody is running scared, covering their mouths and hoping for the best, or talking to each other behind walls, electronic walls, as, as, as you can say. So this has impacted the entire world. And I do believe that the world will change after this because the world was ripe for change and it required a catalyst, required an event like this to bring about change. And what kind of change is something that we need to understand. And then we can see the impact on India and impact on all of us and what may happen in the future and the kind of stimulus that India has. So I think the first point is, it is a global phenomena like no other phenomena that we are seeing in a lifetime. Now, this has impacted the global supply chain. The global supply chain is a result of the industrial revolution and all global supply chains led to China because China has been the fastest growing economy for the last many years. It's $15 trillion in GDP and China manufactures 24% of the world's manufacturing. So China was the exporter, largest exporter of the world, largest importer of the world, largest or second largest oil consumer, largest forex reserves, etc. And the world found to a surprise, so much was dependent on China when China shut up in uh, February, March of this year. The global supply chains were disrupted and the impact is going to be that the global supply chain are going to be distributed because each country is working out its vulnerabilities and all the old fault lines in the global economy, the concentration of power out of the war in five, six countries, the creation of global institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, and also the fact that there's a new hegemon in China as compared to the earlier hegemon of Soviet Russia, which is a basically a European power, is now impacting the world and everybody is beginning to question everything that the world held together. So for the next few years, there is going to be nothing which is constant. Everything is up for grabs, everything is up to challenge, and we don't know how things are going to be. So there is going to be a tremendous amount of change and the world will change. And you folks are in the heart of the oil industry and the oil industry has been changed because oil is a fuel that has been keeping the world going. The world consumes 100 million barrels of oil. Demand has come down by 30%. And demand has come down because China shut up in February and March, and the U.S. started pumping more oil. The U.S. pump was pumping 13.5 million barrels of oil a day due to shale gas and uh, shale oil, and uh, that created surpluses, reducing prices. So when Saudi Arabia tried to tell Russia to come down and cut production, Russia refused because they believed that every time they cut production, America benefited. So there are geopolitics at play already, and this exacerbated when Saudi Arabia increased production to 11, 11 and a half million barrels until uh, President Trump has to talk to people to bring about semblance of order. And the US oil industry collapsed and has come back. And we saw a funny side of a barrel of oil selling for minus $37 on delivery in the derivative exchange. But the key issue is oil consumption for the next two or three years could be soft. While OPEC has cut 9 million barrels a day and may cut more, oil consumption has come back to maybe 80 million barrels. But whether will oil go to 100 million barrels and will balance out, we don't know. We don't know what is going to happen because consumption is getting impacted all around the world. And if consumption gets impacted, oil production gets impacted and oil prices will come down. And these are geopolitical implications. As you know, in uh, Nigeria, the, the president has said they've no, got no money to buy food. We are seeing Iraq getting impacted. We've seen, of course, Venezuela go down the tube. And we're seeing all countries getting impacted. And Saudi Arabia are running a very, very big deficit, increasing their VAT to 15% and uh, charging people, uh, I mean, removing the, the subsidies that certain government people got, uh, which was done much earlier. So very large industry, it was $4 trillion, has suddenly become $2 trillion. Now, all other industries around the world have been impacted, primarily in services. International airlines are down, national airlines are down, Emirates has been impacted, uh, Lufthansa has got a bailout from the government, the US, big, big, Airline companies have got a $45 billion bailout and Virgin Atlantic has gone into receivership and all wrong because all these industries are working at high utilization with low margins. 
So hospitality, retail, travel, tourism, everything is come down because people are not traveling, people are shut up and people are scared to travel. Even when airlines open up, whether people will travel is going to be seen. Today we saw the news of the Air India flight going from Delhi to Moscow and after it left Delhi, it had to be called back because the pilot was, uh, pilot fell sick and they diagnosed COVID-19. So they pulled back the flight. So we don't know what's going to happen. Indigo flew from some, some cities with the no COVID and landed with a few people with COVID on the other side. So people don't know what to do. And we're seeing very large impact in services. And services is a very large part of the global economy for the OECD. Maybe 75, 80% of GDP is based on services. In the United States is 85%. Now, all this has had an impact on unemployment, and we see huge, huge unemployment all around the world. The United States had 40 million people without jobs who have filed for unemployment benefits. The US has 160 million people on payroll, and 40 million today are without jobs. And people say it is as big as the crisis you saw in 1929, which led to the New Deal and took some time to come up. But now we may have a faster recovery. But today, the situation is. 40 million people are without jobs. In the UK, 1 million people are being paid by the government to keep the jobs. All over continental Europe, the same problem is there. About 8 million people undergoing training for skills in Germany. And the same situation is there in China. Japan is seeing a small increase in unemployment. India has seen a massive increase in unemployment. And this has caused concern. In the financial markets, in the financial markets, we have seen large scale pumping in of money. After the global financial crisis, the OECD countries pumped in about uh, five to six trillion dollars of liquidity into the markets. And this liquidity led to interest rates getting negative. Out of 30 to 36 billion dollars, trillion dollars, sorry, trillion dollars of government bonds, 18 trillion dollars were quoting at negative rates. We've never seen negative rates there. And Japan has been pumping money into the economy for a long time. And the Japanese central bank, the Bank of Japan, has started buying equity. Now, suddenly with this crisis, we have seen this massive increase in stimuluses. So in the US, the Fed has pumped in about two and a half, three trillion dollars and said they will buy government bonds, they'll buy corporate bonds, they'll buy ETFs, all kinds of securities to put money into the market. Because the Federal Reserve and the central banks believe that by reducing interest rates to almost zero, creating more liquidity, banks will be forced to lend. And if banks are forced to lend, the companies will have liquidity and they can use that to start operations. Otherwise, they'll shut up shop and they will go into liquidation. So that has been the mantra. And we're seeing in the UK $360 billion of stimulus. And the UK has got $300 billion of loan guarantees. The Bank of England has brought down the overnight interest rates to 25 basis points. And just last week, they issued bonds at a discount. For the first time, negative interest rates in the UK. There have been negative interest rates in France and in Germany. And the US, they're talking about it, though the Federal Reserve says it may not happen. But the problem is that governments have to borrow a lot of money. And the last month, I think this month, in the month of May, the US government is borrowing two and a half trillion dollars. And Japan has come, out, come down with a $950 billion stimulus. And we're seeing this kind of pumping going on. And people believe that before this ends, maybe one year, one and a half years from now, all the central banks will pump in about eight to $10 trillion of uh, liquidity into the market. That means for the foreseeable future, there will be no interest rates going up. So once this stabilizes, our people forget it because people have a short memory. We're going to see this sloshing of global liquidity going to other countries to find returns in real assets. So we're going to see huge liquidity in the global economy. And we could see asset bubbles as early as maybe four to five months from now all over the world. And we need to watch out what will happen. But the ability of central banks to pump in more money is getting vitiated because the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which is now about $5 trillion, may go up to $10 trillion. Even the UK Bank of England may see its balance sheet balloon. The balance sheet of the Bank of Japan has ballooned. The Bundesbank is holding firm. Now the EU has come in with a $800 billion stimulus. So I think we're going to see the financial markets in a state of flux going forward. And then we are seeing many, many countries come out with stimuluses. The US has come out with two and a half trillion dollars, UK 365 billion pounds, and Europe about one and a half trillion dollars between all the countries, Japan nearly a trillion dollars. All over about six, six and a half trillion dollars of stimulus has come up, and people anticipate it may go to eight to 10 trillion dollars. And now this has an impact on global GDP too, 
the IMF has said before COVID that the world may grow at two and a half, three percent this year. Now the IMF says the world may degrow at two and a half percent. And in the first quarter of this year, we've seen the US GDP come down by about four percent, China 6.8 percent, Japan by about I think five percent, UK by two and a half percent, and the France and the Europe is ranging between three to six percent. So all around the world, the first quarter of this calendar year in which COVID impacted those countries for a limited time, barring maybe Italy and Spain, has seen a massive impact on GDP. And this quarter is going to be very, very bad. Uh, people anticipate in the UK that GDP may shrink by 15%. So all around the world, GDP is going to shrink in the second quarter of this calendar year. And I think and I believe that the world GDP of $82 trillion may actually shrink by 8 to 10% for this year. 8 to 10% is a shrinkage nobody has anticipated, nobody has dreamt about, nobody has written about ever in our history. Even during the war, I don't think the global economy shrank so much in any particular year. Now, suddenly, because all economies are consumption-driven economies, people are not consuming because everything is shut down. People can't even go out. People can't work. People cannot do anything. Even in times of war, people went to work. People did many things which are part of the economic activity. But right now, I think everything is shut. And this is going to have a big, big repercussion. And maybe it will take two or three years for the GDP of the world to come back to the GDP, which was there on 31st December 2019. So we, so we see this thing, uh, you know, pan out over a period of time. Now, the big issue is about globalization. We lived in an era where you could go to any country, land there and take a visa. You could take a flight ticket and travel all around the world. You could go for tourism in most part of the world. You could trade, you could transfer money. Everything was free, uh, freely done. But now countries are putting up barriers because they think globalization has gone too far. When China came into the WTO, it made promises. Now countries are saying, you're not kept your promises. And I think China's coming into WTO hurt the West because they saw a lot of the industries going to China. And we've never seen in human history a country come up so quickly like China did. China was $150 billion in 1970, same like India. Now it is about $15 trillion. No country has seen a country exploding growth for such a long period of time like China did. So China has benefited the WTO and President Trump has put in trade barriers on China to say China did not open the market for the US. And even India has a $500 billion trade deficit in the last 10 years. This year we'll have a $60 billion trade deficit with China because China is a mercantilist economy where they export out, but they will not get your goods in. And they're very, very cautious trying to create surpluses. So globalization is in retreat. And President Trump has stopped all visas there for H1B. And Germany and continental Europe are putting up barriers to FDI to say that the Chinese can't come and buy your companies. And in Japan, 450 companies have been classified as national champions to make sure that the Chinese don't come and buy because values have come down in the financial markets. So globalization is under threat. And we don't know the new world economic order, how it is going to be. And two other points which I want to talk about is, in this lockdown, people's habits have changed. Just see where we were before this lockdown and see where we are today. Technology has changed the way we interact with people. Today, we are very scared to talk to people, very scared to meet people. I don't know whether people can ever hug each other in future. <laughs> Everybody is running scared. So for young people, the idea of romance and many nice things they used to do is going to be very, very difficult uh, for the foreseeable future. So people's habits have changed. People are taken to technology. And thankfully, we have the technology. So digital technology has come in in a very big way compared to the past. So today, even the baby boomers born after the Second World War are taken to technology. They buy the goods and services to the mobile phone. They do the banking on the mobile. They see entertainment on the mobile or on their iPads, and they also get health. Uh, they are able to get education, and uh, everything is going in a very different manner. So people's habits have changed. So when this ends, and the slowly people come back to life, is the way that we are living and working going to be the same? I don't know, because you know, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, many, many things change, and we don't know how things are going to be. Are retail shops going to be open? Are malls going to be open? Are people going to shop? Yes, people will shop because that is part of retail therapy. But I think uh, the habits have changed. And what could have taken two to five years has happened 
just in two months because everybody is locked in and that's going to have an impact. But another positive impact is that the world has become a much more healthier place. In most part of the world, the air is fresh, the water is clean, and uh, climate change has been pushed back. And people say this year, carbon uh, discharge into the environment is down by 78%, and we are gained one year in a fight against uh, the you know, climate change, uh, even though we are finding some storms in India and things like that. And people are now saying that climate change can be reversed. Because in the lockdown, we saw everything gets cleaner. So if climate change can be reversed, the economic policies that led to climate change will change because everybody now will say, we want to breathe fresh air. We want to have clean water. We want to be healthy. Because COVID-19 has shown that if you live in a place with dirty air, your lungs will be impacted. And if you get impacted by the virus, then you may die very fast. You may not recover because the lungs are already damaged. And nobody wants to get the lungs damaged because nobody believed the lungs could be damaged so severely. Now they're seeing the impact. So climate change is an important factor as you go along. That means ESG companies and everything else is something that people have to see. That's the positive aspect. Now, what about India? How is it impacting India? Well, India is impacted pretty badly uh, because, you know, we are seeing that the impact of uh, lockdown has had a very big impact all across India. Our GDP numbers came in uh, yesterday. And our GDP for the last year is around 4.2 percent, or 4 percent, and the last quarter was 3.1 percent. And the 3.1 percent, the lowest that we had for the last, I don't remember uh, when it was as low as that. It's been a long time. We don't even remember because we've been growing at a very high pace. So the impact of about 10, 15 days has become a problem uh, because the GDP growth rate is down. And usually, the last two weeks of March are the highest growth rate for everybody, but everybody tries to beat the financial numbers. So the GDP has been deeply impacted. And uh, second, we are, we are seeing that uh, all across India, unemployment has gone up. CMI came and said the unemployment has gone to 125 million people because everything is shut. Now, India has got a bigger, bigger thing than uh, most countries. We have a population of 1.37 billion people. Uh, people about 60 are about maybe 13%. That's 170 million. So we got about 1.2 billion people. Or 1.2 billion people, people below the age of 20 or 500 million. So we got 700 million people between the age of 20 and 60, out of which 550 million or so are in the working group. And out of them, 43% uh, is in agriculture, that's 250 million. Out of 300 million, CMI says about 120 million are out of jobs, though last week they said in one week 20 million came back to jobs. I'm not sure the numbers, but all I can say is many, all the companies are shut, work has not gone on, it just started now. And there's large scale unemployment, large scale layoffs all over because people uh, don't have cash to sustain themselves. I'll give you some data. So we're going to have an unemployment challenge this year till the economy comes back and there is great pain. And we had a migrant problem. We suddenly saw a large number of people in the big cities wanting to go back home because when Prime Minister Modi shut up India on March 25th, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, 72 million migrants come from the labor supply states of Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal, Rajasthan, uh, Rajasthan, down to Delhi, Mumbai, and the South. And uh, suddenly, uh, after a couple of weeks, people who are migrants working in small jobs in the informal sector suddenly discovered they had no money. Because most of the migrants are not paid very well. They get, you know, 12, 15,000 rupees, they leave by the street, they leave in the slums, they leave day to day, and uh, they send five to 6,000 rupees uh, back home to the villages, uh, remittance. So the remittance economy in India is very strong. And for those of you who like data, 9% of Kerala's population uh, speaks Hindi. So if you go to Kochi, you can see Hindi. I couldn't believe it till I went there and saw for myself. And the 9% is, uh, uh, you know, speaks Hindi. Many of them have come from Bihar. Whole villages are full of Biharis. And for a Bihari, getting 750 rupees in Kerala is very, very good. So Kerala is a new Dubai for people from Bihar. And after people come, they get their whole family to come. And now I think they work in construction other areas. And by maybe 2030, this 9% may go to 15, 20%. So I'm very scared my Malayali friends uh, could become a smaller part of the population in Kerala, just like they have gone to the Middle East and are now are coming back. Some of them are quickly coming back to make sure they have space in their own state. But we are seeing this kind of rapid changes. And... Um, some of the state governments have played politics. So we saw many migrants walking back 50, 100,000 kilometers. And there have been many deaths there. So it's a very sad story of a large number of people living in informal occupations 
not being contacted by the respective government, not being on anybody's radar, just being there, exploited for the labor. And now suddenly this blown up into a national issue. And this will have a repercussion on the politics and the policies uh, going forward. And uh, how did the government of India react and what happened? Well, let me, let, let me, let me tell you that government, uh, government reacted in a, in a rather a steady manner. Uh, when the first, when this first, when this happened first time, the government immediately came out with a one lakh seventy thousand crore program to help the poor. That means they sent uh, five hundred rupees a month for three months to the bank account of twenty crore women because we are DPT. It's wonderful they could do it. Whereas in America and Japan, to send the checks they had to struggle, and they gave three months free gas to all the women, eight crore women, and then they gave three and a half crore construction workers three thousand rupees a month for three months. And then they allowed people with PF and ESI to withdraw the money that they had in their account. And they also made sure that they gave free rations to everybody. 80 crore people got free rations for three months and the old age pensions are given in advance, et cetera. 170,000 crore was spent. And even the state governments all over tried to do their best in the first two or three weeks of uh, this kind of a, uh, you know, the giving stimulus and support to people. But the problem has been extremely large and the government is now realizing the repercussions of all this. The Reserve Bank of India also got into the draw and the Reserve Bank of India did many, very many things. They increased liquidity by 8 lakh crores in the hope, like other central banks have done, that the banks will come and, uh, you know, banks will come and lend money to people because people don't have enough money since revenues have been logged in. The Reserve Bank of India reduced the CRR from 4% to 1-3%, giving 1 lakh 37,000 crores. They removed the kind of liquidity they must keep at the bank that released the one lakh thirty seven thousand crores. Then they gave refinancing operations for in three or four areas that released two and a half lakh crores. Totally about eight lakh crore was released by the Reserve Bank of India to everybody, and that had this uh, impact too. But the sad thing is the banks were very scared to lend. The banks were also shut down, and the banks put all the money into the reverse repo. The Reserve Bank of India brought down the interest rates by nearly. 1%, 50% in the 50% uh, once and 40%. And now the repo, repo rate has come to 4%. And the reverse repo is about, I think, 3.2% uh, or so. So all the banks started keeping money back with the Reserve Bank of India because the liquidity was built up and the banks are not lending. So we're back to square one where liquidity has been built up, but banks are not lending because they're scared of NPA, they're scared of uh, risk. Then over a period of time, the government also came out with a series of projections a series of stimuluses. Prime Minister Modi came and told us very clearly that he's going to have a 20 lakh stimulus for Atma Nirban Bharat, where he said we are going to be self-sufficient and we are going to build a new India, etc. He's been talking about the new India for the last three to four years and saying India will be a $5 trillion economy. I believe India could be a $5 trillion economy by 2026, not 2025, because this year is going to be not a very good year. So the government came out with a series of programs and the strategy of the government was very clear. The fiscal deficit is out of control. For last year, the figures that come out, our fiscal deficit has gone up from 3.8% to around 4.6, 4.7%. And the tax collections are down by, I think, 2.6 or 3 lakh crores. So tax collections have fallen off in just two to three weeks of the last financial year. They've not been able to collect the tax. And this year, too, the government was scheduled to borrow 7 lakh crores, or so they're borrowing 12 lakh crores. And the fiscal deficit this year was 3.5%. And government of India this year may go to 5 and 6%. The states are supposed to be under 3%. And they may go to 5, 5 and percent So 10 to 11% of GDP of 205 lakh crores could be the fiscal deficit. That means 20, 25 lakh crores will be borrowed this year. As against maybe 12 lakh crores, they're supposed to be, maybe you know, 10 lakh crores, they're supposed to be borrowed this year from the markets. So RBI will have to step up. And the government strategy is very clear. We're going to pump money into the market. We're going to make sure people get loans and we're going to give some relief. So the government had the first stimulus, 1.70 lakh crores. Then they came out with a series of stimuluses. They had a loan guarantee scheme for MSMEs of 3 lakh crores to incentivize the banks to lend. They said, we'll give you 100% guarantee. First year, you don't have to pay back. And the next three years, you could pay. And the interest rate will be lower. And of course, it will be fully guaranteed by the central government. Now, the scheme is being rolled out, and the MSMEs had a problem. In April, there was a survey which said 25% of MSMEs have money only for one month, and another 25% had money for three months. And the three months, 
will uh, possibly end by about June. And the stimulus is uh, still being rolled out at the beginning of June. So for the month of March, the payroll was kept because people worked most of March. In the month of April, there were layoffs, 35, 40% layoffs. In the month of uh, May, I think the layoffs have gone up to 50% all over. People are not talking about it because about 50% of formal employment in India is contract labor and that is getting impacted. So they rolled out this three lakh course in the hope that MSMEs will have cash to get back people. Because the government idea was we can give more grants to people, income support, but if we spend all the money tomorrow when industry has to come back, if the MSMEs are dead, where is the employment going to be? So we rather pump in money into the MSMEs and give them subsidies so that they can get liquidity and they can start operating and hopefully people will get back the jobs and will come back to normal faster. Then they also came out with the fund of fund for MSMEs because MSMEs lack capital. They came out with the 90,000 crore relief mechanism for power. They reduced the tax duration as source uh, for all companies by about 50,000 crores to put more liquidity to enhance the people. And the farmers, they came out with the 2 lakh crore credit support to the Kisan card, 1 lakh crore investment for the infrastructure fund. And they also came out with another uh, 70,000 crore uh, support for housing, etc. Overall, I think the government has come out with a 12 lakh crore program and our 20 lakh crore, about 2 lakh 90,000 crore will impact the budget. That is nearly about 1.5% of GDP and the balance of 8.5% uh, will be stimulus by the RBI, which is around 4% and stimulus by the government through loan guarantees, which is another about 4.9%. So much, much larger amount of money out of this 20 lakh crore is gone up as uh, liquidity support uh, by loan guarantees and otherwise. And the direct income support is only 1.5 lakh crores, about 2 lakh 98 thousand crores. So is it going to turn around the economy? We have to wait and see. So what is going to be the impact on the economy and how are things going to change uh, for India? Well, interest rates are going to come down. The FD rates have been cut for some time. So most companies will get benefits the next two or three months. Bankers have reduced the interest rate by about 50 basis points. And I think the, 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 we have to wait and see whether much more reduction will happen. But the sad thing is in India, many seniors and pensioners depend on bank deposits for interest. They're going to feel the pinch. So a section of society is going to suffer for all of us to get lower interest rates. Second, uh, we don't know whether this will get industry back to power. Many of the industries are now started off. They're borrowing in the markets. They're trying to start operations but sales are not happening. In the month of April, for the first time in India's history, not a single car was sold. Can you believe it in a month where we sell three lakh cars a month, not a single car was sold because everything was shut and everything uh, was closed. And I think there were some problems in the stimulus. So this year, entire year, we could see lower interest rates and we could see negative inflation. Inflation in the CPI is about 4.5%, but for the balance of the year, we're going to see a much reduced inflation and maybe a negative inflation because commodity prices are down globally. Commodity prices are down in India. Steel prices are down. Aluminum is down. Iron ore is down, etc. Even though globally iron ore has gone up, oil prices have not come down because government has imposed taxes by about 50% more. So they're mopping up all the money. And government may lose 30% of the tax revenues that they had budgeted. Government of India had budgeted about 21 lakh crores of tax uh, revenue this year. And they may lose about six lakh crores. We don't know because you know everything has been shut down and people may not make profits to pay corporate tax. And even the GST has come down, they're not announced the results. Because this is a unheard of situation, unknown situation, and people are struggling all over. So we could see inflation becoming negative and growth coming down. So what are the growth prospects? Well, at the beginning of COVID, people said growth will be two, two and a half percent. Now then they said it will be minus two and a half percent of the latest estimates. Uh, growth will be down 5 to 6%. So globally, growth may be down 8 to 10% for the year. India right now, they're saying 5 to 6%. It could go down to maybe 5 to 8% by the time the year ends, uh, that is uh, including inflation. So we could see some impact. Now, what about the impact of the global supply chain on India? Government India also used the opportunity to liberalize many industries. They liberalized the, uh, the defense industry by opening up to FDI. They liberalized... Uh, uh, agriculture by saying that the farmers are now free to sell. They don't have to go to the mandis to sell. And the Essential Commodities Act was, was uh, amended to make sure that uh, stocking limits and others will not be there on certain commodities. And last year, we had a bumper agriculture crop. Agriculture has grown at 4% last year. Agriculture makes up 15% of GDP and it's grown at 4%. And this year, too, the monsoon may be good 
So we could have a surplus crop too. And uh, this year we'll have 297 million tons of food grains, which is very, very large. We must understand that India is a very large agricultural market too. 43% uh, of India's population are dependent upon agriculture. So the positive is that agriculture may be a good, but agriculture's contribution GDP is only 15%, industry is 25%, and the services 60%. In industry, there could be a 10 to 15% decline this year. In services, 60%. The government sector is doing well. Trade, retail, hospitality, aviation, travel will not do well. Professional services may see a decline for the first two quarters, and then may do well. What about the IT industry? Well, the IT industry is not going to have a good year this year. This quarter, next quarter, there could be negative growth. And the people hope that from October onwards, growth will come back because in the, most of the income is from the West. We have an IT industry of $150 billion, four and a half million people are employed. And uh, the good thing was that 90% of four and a half million transitioned to work from home uh, within about 15 days. Within 15 days. Uh, four, 4 million people started working from home. It's unheard of. I'm, I'm also pleasantly surprised. And now about 10% have come back to work. Hopefully, they'll come back to work later. And this may result in more people working from home at a later date. Uh, so we are seeing the service industry is also getting impacted in a, in a very big way. So growth may be down and growth may pick up. And I do believe that uh, this quarter is not going to be a good quarter. Next quarter, we could have maybe 40 to 50% capacitalization. We could go to 60 to 70% in January, February, March. As far as employment is concerned too, this quarter unemployment will come down because the people are starting off. The construction industry may start off. And next quarter, we could see an increase, but we will not come back to the same level of employment that we had on the 1st of March, 2020, till maybe one, one and a half years because consumer demand has come down and for demand to come back, a lot more needs to be done. And I think we must uh, increase our spending. So now, is global trade changes going to impact India? We are seeing that uh, much of the Chinese manufacturing uh, shifted to uh, Vietnam over the last one or two years because Vietnam has got 95 million people, 1,200 kilometers of border with China. And the Chinese went there and set it up. In China, contrary to what people believe, a large part of the manufacturing is contract manufacturing. The Chinese entrepreneurs set up the factory, they produce, the Western companies come and get their brands put there and get exported. So the vendors were asked to shift and they shifted to Vietnam and we're seeing some of the work come to Kampuchea, some to Southeast Asia. Government of India believes at least some of it will come to India. We have to wait and see. The challenge is that the government of India has improved ease of doing business. It really works. But the state governments have to give the land, they have to give the power, and they have to give many things. And I think it's very important for them to get their act together. And for that to happen, it'll take some time. Yogi Adityanath of UP is off the ground. He set up a team of people and just yesterday announced that one million of his uh, migrants who have come back are going to get local jobs. And he's very intent. The state of Tamil Nadu has set up a group. Karnataka has set up a group. And everybody is now trying to go out to get them. So it may take time to come. Apple has announced they'll manufacture in India. The electronic trade may come to India. So India is going to benefit. But how much is going to benefit? Uh, we have to wait and see. Uh, because, you know, India is not a difficult place to do business. But for a foreign company to come in and set up shop is going to take two or three years. I've been telling Indian industrialists that they have to do contract manufacturing. Like China, we have to do contract manufacturing, come back, uh, contract manufacturing to get the Western banks to come. And we are going to see Samsung open a very large factory in India. The Japanese are looking at coming to India because the Japanese are trying to get back the industry uh, from China. And then in terms of work habits, you know, India has become, India has gone digital. You'll all be surprised at the quantum of digital work that is going on. Today, all across India, in many of these areas, people are doing e-commerce to get all the commodities at home. I've been logged in since March 11, 2020. I just went out yesterday to go to a doctor. I've been inside and uh, I don't know whether I'm going to go out the next two weeks. And of course, uh, technology has helped me because we order on e-commerce. I do Zoom and talk to people on conferences all over. And entertainment is available there on Netflix and Hotstar. Hotstar has gone up. Netflix has gone up. And all over the country, I'm told that young children get up in the morning, wash up, have their breakfast, put on the uniform, and go in set of the PC and sit down and do their classes till 4 o'clock. And then they go, go, go to the room and change the dress and play inside the house. And they are just So education has gone up. Baiju, the largest tech company, uh, where we put in the first check about nine years ago, 
has uh, seen an increase in uh, subscribers by about 6 million. Suddenly in two months when they went free, they had 6 million. And now I think the business is booming for them. And we've seen many e-commerce companies uh, going to uh, go, doing well. So electronics and banking has gone fully electronic. So everything has gone electronic. So when India opens up, things are going to be very different and things will be, uh, things will, an industry will have to take change, will have to take note of this change. So which are the industries which are going to be impacted in India? What will be the impact? Now, the positive thing is electronics may see a positive impact because India has become a major manufacturer of mobile phones. India makes 250 mobile phones, about 250,000 crores of mobile phones are made here. India has become an exporter. Last year, we got exporters maybe $4 billion. This year, we are supposed to export $10 billion. I don't know what is going to happen. Value added is about 30%. And now, since we got tariffs and programs, you may see the Chinese companies coming here and trying to uh, improve manufacturing. Pharma is a very, very big industry and pharma is growing. Pharma has done very well last quarter, is doing very well now because of exports. You heard the President Trump has talked to Modi about getting Indian pharma there. 45% of generics in America comes from India, but suddenly we discovered that our APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, 90% come from China. We were the exporters of API, but China dominated that because they know how to make commodities at scale. So we import from China and we make the formulations and export to America. So now government has come out a 7,500 crore program to get the APIs uh, made in India too. So we're going to see, uh, we're going to see, you know, the pharma industry do well. IT industry will come back possibly in October and we could see another increase in IT because the world has realized that you have to go digital. And in the best, many, many large companies have a lot of legacy issues and the only country where they can change rapidly is India. And India has got a huge talent pool and that will come up. The startup industry has been impacted. We got 45,000 startups who created $160 billion of value. We got $60 billion come in. Government has shut off China from this or a $60 billion, $8 billion of China. And many of these young companies don't have money because of bad tax rates. So maybe 10, 20% of startups will not come back uh, when the things uh, improve. About 60% uh, of startups don't have money more than uh, three months. And that is a big challenge. But uh, the good startups are doing well and the good startups will start employing people. They've been shedding people for the last two months. Now I'm hearing that they may also come back and they increase people. Uh, in the metal industry, India is the second largest producer of steel. So I think they're looking at exports in a very big way. Steel consumption has come down, but I think it will come back. In auto too, everybody is looking at exports. We're seeing auto companies come out with new deals whereby they're coming and giving credit at very low rates. I read somewhere that Telco is giving a car at three and a half thousand rupees a month. Like in America, you can get a Benz at $250 a month uh, in rental. India could to see that just to push sales. And the two-wheeler market is just opening up. So auto will be down, but auto I think will be fine. And auto is a very large part of uh, India's GDP. The real estate has got deep challenges. India has got something like 36 months or 40 months of stock. And real estate before this crisis itself was uh, shaky. And now we are seeing many real estate companies' projects come down. Government may have to come with the stimulus to take care of them because real estate is the second largest employer in India after agriculture. And I think it's very important for a government to do something. And then we are seeing in other professional services, consulting opportunities are coming down, but slowly people are coming back. So I do believe that some industries will do well and recover quickly, and some industries may not do well. And I believe the banks are going to boom because India's lending to GDP is very low, just 50% of GDP. India's deposit GDP is about 65%. Just about 1 crore, 3 lakh crore is lent in the market as against 1 crore, 37 lakh crore of bank deposits. And now most companies which are cash are spending the cash and they're going to the banks and borrowing. And I think 80% of companies who borrow from the banks are rated uh, BBB plus. And I think uh, now they're going to the banks to borrow money because they're running out of cash. In the first quarter, most will make losses. So NPS could rise, but the bank's lending book is going to go up. And hopefully, if enough good companies borrow money, they'll see an increase in the income enough to pay for the NPS. Government has also come with a 3 lakh crore uh, bank guarantee scheme for lending to MSMEs. And that may improve, uh, improve, the, improve the ability of these companies to come. What about the work life? How are people going to work? Uh, TCS has said by 2025, 75% of people work from home. I don't believe so. But what will happen is for most companies, 25 to 30% of people will definitely start working from home. Because 
companies are scared to get everybody at play. And now even if people come to the office, there'll be a problem because you've got to maintain social distancing. Most offices are crowded, extremely crowded. The space per person is very low. And uh, you can't have social distancing with a very tight fit. So 25 to 30%, 40% of people will always work from home. And that means commute times will come down, traffic will come down. So Bangalore's famous traffic may come down a little bit to make life more comfortable. In Delhi too, the traffic may come down. Bombay, the traffic may come down, etc. The airline industry will be impacted because uh, government may allow international travel only by August, September. Though I don't know where people will travel. You know, the travel, they have to be safe for 10, 11 hours in the flight. National travels is going to start. And we already started maybe 30, 35% capacity in the next two weeks. And to come back to the same madness that we had with crowded airports, that may take another one or two years. Uh, all the hotels are deeply in trouble. This year, hotels will make a big loss. Tourism is down in the dumps because nobody is traveling. Uh, and retail stores are down in the dump except for e-commerce. The malls are still not open. Shops are opening. So there will be impact on retail. There will be impact on the small traders, etc. And we could get some kind of normality uh, only by September, October. As far as COVID is concerned, uh, India's cases are going up by about 7,000 a month. I think this, there's a big problem. And I think uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a problem. We don't know when it's going to peak. People believe by June it will peak. Uh, the death rate is very low in India. The numbers are small compared to the United States. So we have about 1,67,000 cases uh, for 1,70,000 cases for about, uh, you know, 137 crore population. And that means it could be about 100 people, 100 people per, uh, per, per 1 million. And uh, if you take out for the U.S., uh, U.S. has got about uh, totally about 1.2 million for a population of 320 million. That's about nearly three and a half, four thousand per million population. U.S. has 100,000 dead for about 320 million. That's about 300 per million. India has got only about four and a half thousand dead for uh, 1.37 billion. And that is possibly about 30 per million. So those indications India is doing well, but it may increase. But people have become desperate. They rather go out and work and earn a living and take the risk of uh, facing COVID rather than get stuck. Bombay is in deep trouble because Bombay has seen increase in cases that just today they announced that they're going to take over some hospital, some hotels to convert into hospitals. Uh, Delhi has announced 3,000 hotel beds to be converted into hospitals. So I think everybody is getting prepared. There are 23 lakh people under quarantine in India. 23 lakh people. When I was shocked with the number, a large number of people are in the quarantine at home uh, because they believe they have that uh, the virus. They're not very sure, but that's going to happen. Of course, there have been some good news too. And the good news is people's habits have changed. So business in future has to be very different. I'll explain what people have to do. Uh, the environment has become uh, cleaner. Uh, in Ludhiana, you can see the Himalayas. In Delhi, they say they had alpine weather, even though today they have 47 degrees. And the 47 degrees heat is unbelievable how hot Delhi can get. And the Delhi had fresh air. They could actually see India Gate. <laughs> they could see India Gate from North Block. They couldn't see India Gate. And the people are saying we are getting fresh air, fresh water. The Jamuna has become clean. And it's surprising the Ganga has become clean in Haridwar. And even in Varanasi, they say we can see the bottom of the river. We can see fishes in the river. And all around, people are seeing the environment remarkably change. In the two months, fresh air, fresh water. Even in Bangalore, I could see the blue sky. And the air has become fresher. So people have become healthier. And I was speaking to Dr. Balal of Manipal Hospital today. And he said more than the number of deaths have come down all across India. India used to have 1,60,000 people die in accidents. With everything shut, nobody is dead in accidents, except some migrants who got into accidents. And in Mumbai, in the trains, 10 to 12 people fell off the trains and died every day. The trains have been shut, and people are not dying. So many people are not dying because of heart attacks or stress or whatever it is. Even though hospitals have been shut, and they're only, some are working only at 30%, so regular treatment is not happening. But all over the country, the death rates have come down, and we don't know. Uh, what exactly is happening. And doctor says that people are becoming healthy, they're washing their hands, communica communicable disease is coming down, and asthma, I mean, not asthma, I mean, uh, you know, the lung disease have come down, etc. So there's been a change in health. So work from home will have a positive impact, digitization will have a positive impact, and the global reordering of supply chain will have a positive impact. Now, how should businesses behave in India in the future? Now, I do believe that there's a wake-up call for India to change the way they do business. First of all, you need to have a digital strategy with you. You got to go digital because people 
will only come to you to do business in a digital manner. If you're not on the web, if you don't have a digital interface for business, I think your sales are going to be impacted. So people have to change. Second, people have to build liquidity in the balance sheet. At Infosys from 94, we said we'll have enough cash in the balance sheet to, uh, uh, to, to meet all our costs for one year without earning a single penny of revenue. Now, people used to laugh at us, but after 25 years, this come true, and Infi has got about 35,000 crore of cash. Uh, TCS has got 40,000 crore of cash. The IT companies, the big ones, are doing pretty well. Uh, they got cash. So businesses have to keep cash in the bank, uh, even though they could have bank limits, they could have debt, but they got to maintain liquidity because they don't know when this COVID is going to on. Third, we have to improve productivity. That means people have to do double, twice the kind of transactions that they do because productivity has been low in India and that has to improve. Our supply chain has to improve. Supply chain costs us 14% of GDP. The GST has come down to 12%. With better transportation and roads, has come down to 10%. So today we are close to 10%. I think the road transport industry has just come back to 40% of what it was. The power consumption has come back to maybe 85% of what it was. So we have to improve supply chain. Our railways will probably are traveling at 25 kilometers an hour. Now they're doing 65 kilometers an hour because there's no passenger rail, passenger traffic. And I think after the Eastern, Eastern Highway and the Western Highway for the rail come through, we, they'll probably transfer at 45. So in the next two, three years, supply chain costs are going to come down. India is going to become that much more efficient. And the next point for industry has been that uh, industry has to uh, reduce the processes. All of us know that big, in big industry, we all become victims of processes. Victims are, you know, processes are important to grow companies, but processes are also making us slower. Now I think companies are cutting the processes to make sure they can interact and uh, meet the customer's demands first love for much better. And lastly, uh, they're, they're shedding people. All industry are shedding people to keep costs low. So we could find the jig economy, the jig economy go up. In the jig economy, people will be individual performers. They'll come on contract. They'll not be permanent employers. So they have to look around. The jig economy is taking off. Maybe a couple of million people are working there. And this could become a very large part of industry. When industry starts hiring again, they may hide them on consultancy assignments rather than take uh, permanent labor. So... I think industry is changing its much habits and most people are looking at the global market to expand. What about employment? I think employment will come back to 80% of what it was by maybe about December, January. And white collar employment is tough. There has been a lot of shedding, but people are looking at hiding again. But the biggest challenge, sadly, is going to be for people in the age group of maybe 45, 55. 45, 55 is a very vulnerable group uh, because most of them our experienced people who have been working and now the people, industries are shedding senior people because they cost a lot of money. And the thing, once senior people goes, you can get up four or five younger people and somehow train them up. And with the last four to five years, revenue growth has not been high. So there has been a log jam at the senior levels. Now people are trying to shed people at that age. So I think it's going to be dicey for people who are older. They have to wait longer to come. Is there going to be employment for people who come back from the Gulf and other places? Well, it depends on what you are. If you're highly qualified professionals, you have good skills, yes, the prospects are bright because industry will want to get people with better skills. There certainly is going to be there. The banking industry is also opening up. If you're professionals, can you work in firms? Yes. I think more work will happen for chart accounts and others because I think compliance and other things are coming up. They're becoming bigger challenges as things go by. There is complication. And in strategy and changing business processes, CS will do very well. And what about ordinary people who are clerks and other people? That is going to be tough because a lot of younger people are coming. Nine million graduates come out of colleges every year. So if people are there with lower skills, just doing processes, there is going to be a challenge for them. And what about blue collar workers, et cetera? For the skilled, highly skilled people at lower salaries, there is work in real estate and other places. For the semi-skilled, there is work. I think the Gulf returnees, if they're willing to work for lower salaries because they're no quality, they run better processes, they will have good work. They have, may have to wait for some time. So employment will take some time to pick up and we can only see a down, we upturn only in October, uh, October, November. Now, the last question which I'll answer before we go to Q&A is, are there going to be more stimuluses? So my view is, uh, Prime Minister Modi has come out with this 20 lakh program, largely stimuluses, largely liquidity measures on the supply side, not on the demand side. Demand side is very low, where it's pumping money in for consumption. But I think they're keeping the powder dry because everybody knows this is not going to end. This is going to be a bad year for India. 
Fiscal deficit may end up at 12, 13% of GDP. Government revenues are coming down. Government has got a huge budget to spend. And I think, you know, they'll keep the spending or cut a little bit of the spending. They can't cut much more. So they will have to borrow money. So I think he's keeping some money for some other stimulus a little bit later, maybe some small tax breaks to keep the middle class happy, et cetera. So I think we have not heard the last of the stimuluses. They could be more on the way, but it'll come slowly. And as far as I know, his uh, focus is not on the middle class. His focus on the lower middle classes and the vulnerable sections, rightly so. But I do hope he gives something to the middle class because they are getting a bit upset because they're losing jobs and they've got EMIs to pay. And as far as EMIs are, uh, are, bothered, are concerned, they're given a six months uh, waiver for them. And uh, that's not enough. So I think we'll see some more stimuluses as uh, time goes by. So I'll end here by saying it's a global crisis. Our habits, our work, work procedures have to change. And uh, who is going to be the winner, we have to see. But India certainly will grow the year after. 21, 22 is going to be a good year for India. And India may grow maybe 6 to 9%. In real terms, it may grow maybe 5 to 6%. And I think India is, India is supply constrained, not demand constrained. The US will take two or three years to recover, as also continental Europe. And I think Europe is going to be hit very, very badly. The Middle East will have to decide what to do with the oil, etc. The oil economy is better. And, uh, you know, Japan is hit because the population is shrinking. China will grow slower because China will not be able to export. All countries are going uh, against China. And China may start dumping. In which case, people will put up tariff barriers, etc. So that will happen. In Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa will be hit because commodity prices are down. Commodity prices may not go up because China was a big driver of growth. And globally, the global demand is uh, down. And this having an impact in India. This year is not going to be a good year. We may degrow this year 5 to 6%. The world will degrow this year. And the next year for India is going to be a good year because it will bounce back. Agriculture has been good. Unemployment is large. It's coming down. And uh, employment will only come back to 80% normal by the year end. And I think many industries will have to change the ways. And technology and digital has <laughs> come upon us. And technology digital is going to be a big winner. That's why we see Reliant Geo do very well and get about you know, $10, $11 billion of investment in just one month. And the Reliant Geo may be India's Alibaba or maybe India's, uh, you know, whatever it is, Amazon and whatever it is for a period of time. And we're seeing Bharti Airtel do well and the technology companies will do well, the IT companies will do well. So we have to live in hope. And India certainly has a very bright future. This is painful, but you know, we are supply constrained. So India will do well, it's a matter of time. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Mahesh Bhai? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mohanda, sir, for uh, giving us a complete perspective uh, globally as well as uh, from India perspective. And this is what, of course, the, you know, the participants were looking forward. Uh, before I get into the Q&A part, I just want to you know, uh, rewind uh, uh, you know, our last interaction, which is about uh, six months ago in, uh, in Bahrain. Uh, when uh, we were uh, in the international conference uh, discussing how disruption can be a catalyst for growth. Of course, uh, none of us ever dreamt that six months down the line, we'll be talking about a virus causing a worldwide disruption and you know, keeping, our, keeping us you know, homebound. Uh, thanks again for sharing this perspective. I'm going to jump into the Q&As. We have a lot of Q&As. I will start in the order in which they received and of course take some of the important ones. Uh, one of the important thing is from a, you know, uh, the investors who are keeping money in the fixed deposits. How safe are the FDs with the banks in India in the light of the enormous resources being allocated for the economic recovery of the various sectors? Well, we have seen in the Yes Bank episode that the RBI has not allowed the banks to go down. Now our uh, uh, you know, deposit insurance has come to 5 lakhs. I know 5 lakhs is a very small amount uh, for everybody. But I think the banks are reasonably safe. But I would advise everybody to keep money in two or three banks, including uh, you know, the bigger banks, etc. You can keep money in the smaller bank. They're perfectly safe. The RBI will stand behind them because one bank getting impacted will have a contagion impact. And the Yes Bank episode has been a very big thing. Uh, cooperative banks are a bit of a problem because they're all black holes. We don't know. So you've got to be careful when you have a cooperative bank. So I think, you know, it's reasonably safe. I won't worry. I won't worry. I kept some money with some of the private banks and I think I feel quite comfortable. The next question is, which are the private banks you have dealt with? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I dealt with RBL. I dealt with, uh, you know, uh, you know, IDFC first. And 
I dealt with Yes Bank. Uh, you know, Yes Bank Thank was you. a very, very uh, different kind of a bank run by Rana. Rana is now gone to jail, and the SBI has taken <laughs> over. It's very sad what exactly happened with Rana, because you know Rana came with a lot of promise, but I think is uh, RBI stepped in and uh, got a bailout like it happened in the United States. I think that's the right way to do things because you can't let the bank down because then it hurts uh, the sentiments of everybody. So I, I deal with private banks. I deal with the public sector banks. I think they're quite okay. Thank you, sir. The next Mahesh, question, bhai, uh, Mahesh Bhai, if you can just allow me to ask the follow-up question. Please, because please. someone from India was just asking and uh, Mr. Mondas have touched that also. The interest rate are reducing, which is impacting the middle class and the lower class who mainly put the money into deposits. So while they are saying they have the food for the poor, they have X, Y, Z for the industries, good uh, terms of banks for this, what is there for middle class? Their main source is the investment in deposits and the rates are reducing. So how they can bridge the gap between inflation and the deposit rates? I agree with you. I think inflation is down, luckily. But, uh, you know, I understand what you're saying. There is, a, uh, there is a feeling of great unhappiness that the middle class has not got anything. And I don't see it any, anything for the middle class in the Prime Minister Modi's letter. He wrote a letter to everybody. He's come out on Twitter today. I didn't see him mention the middle class, and I'm a bit apprehensive. In fact, I signed a, uh, you know, I signed a petition on change.org, O-R-G, to ask Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman to look at something for the middle class too. Now, I've been talking to government and telling them, you must do something for the middle class, give them a tax break or something, something to keep them happy. Because they're very worried. And they're the large consuming class. And they're honest taxpayers. They've been paying the bulk of taxes in this country. And you can't let them down. Hopefully, they will listen. So let's wait and see. But I agree with you. I share your concern about the middle class. as a matter of great worry. Thank you. Uh, Mohanda, sir, a question on the bank uh, extending credit. You indicated that, you know, the central uh, the Reserve Bank, uh, you know, lowered the CRR and made sure there's more liquidity. But the banks took the money and they put back in the repo, the reverse repo. So the question is, how is bank credit going to be extended when prior to COVID-19 itself, bank credit was not forthcoming due to the various fear factors, one of them being the rise in the NPAs? Well, let me explain. You know, we got to deconstruct the bank lending. There are about 25, 30 companies, 30% 30 of the bank lending is to large corporates, which are very good. The lending will go on because banks are giving money. SBI has said that uh, all the good customers, the increasing working capital limit by 10%. And SBI... And the, and, the, and the MSME total lending is 20 lakh crores. And uh, that's why the government has said, we'll give you 20% of that as guaranteed loans. So the guaranteed loans will be taken up. And of course, uh, there'll be much more consumer finance available because the big companies will start semi-guaranteeing are keeping something. So I think the, the, the problem cases for industry is 20%. 20% of them are not investment grade. Uh, so the, and, and BBB may be 10%, so 30%. Barring the 30%, 70% will want more money. Uh, now, some of the good companies uh, are drawing bank limits for the first time in many years because this quarter, they're going to be making large losses because they have to pay labor, they have to pay everybody else, and there are no revenues. Next quarter, too, they may require support. And for them to make it up, will take another one year because cash flows are down. And uh, banks also have given moratorium for six months. RBI has extended six months. And that means the money will not be coming back. The book will remain the same. So I believe this year it will go up. Yes, there'll be a rise in NPS. The net NPS across the banking system is something like about 6%. That is uh, gross NPA minus provision is 6%. And I think uh, they could go up by 2 or 3% this year. And they will have to make provision and take a higher spread. So there's going to be painful. The public sector banks are uh, being forced to lend more money. So they will see greater NPS. The private sector banks are very cautious. They will see lesser NPS. They're not going to lend money. And unlike the last time, a lot of money was given for project financing. There is no funding of project financing. And last time, if you look at the top 20 NPAs, they were all groups which have over leverage. Now those kind of excesses are not there. So the excess, if at all, could be some decent company or good companies going down. So I think that I believe the numbers will be very much less. In consumer finance, yes, of course, 20% of people for SBI have taken the moratorium, or of which uh, maybe 10% could have NPS, but I think they'll wear out over a period of time. LGFC gave a moratorium. So I believe there is going to be increase in NPA 2 or 3%. The banks have to make good. The public sector will get funded by the budget and the private sector will be slightly cautious. But I think they'll be forced to lend money and uh, without lending money and without taking risks, the economy won't come back. 
thank you sir so there is a growing frustration and if you ask me where at least on the social media of which i am also a strong, you know active member is china's loss could be india's opportunity but india didn't do enough to capitalize on that opportunity and that opportunity went begging and vietnam and maybe some of the other countries you mentioned uh, you know managed to get a bulk of the companies uh, especially from the united states so do you see that assessment uh, i mean which is a general assessment uh, true and whether you see that india could have done much more and must have done much faster than maybe some of the ways the other countries moved india could have done much faster and much better i agree with you but the challenge with india is who has to do it now india has got 29 states modi has liberalized you know got fdi in everything that could be done but modi cannot give land modi cannot give power modi cannot give them anything else so all this has to be given by the state governments and the state governments are just not up to the task they all think that they'll go overseas they'll have a nice uh, jaunt around go meet people talk to them and when those people come back and say what happened there's nobody to talk to them there's a problem so we are suggested to government that the set up in each state something like the economic development board of singapore will be there full time to do that karnataka has started other states are starting but now state governments have become very serious yogi adityanath has become very serious you'll be very surprised the yogi is much more pro industry than anybody else and it's very shocking to many of you but he has done it and i think he'll be successful because up is a big state karnataka and the southern states are doing so i do believe that it will take time india will benefit a bit not to the same extent but the good news is the indian industrialists understood that they must go global they must export more so they may set up contract manufacturing the key is contract manufacturing for example some of the companies i know are talking to samsung talking to the japanese say we'll produce here for you and uh, we will uh, you know you can put your chapa and your brand and export it from here and india has become efficient in export because of good logistics the gst coming in the ports becoming much more efficient so india has become much more efficient in the last 3 4 years now is the local industries should do it and i think all of them are getting aware so india will be slow to take off but when the economy starts reviving then i think we'll see much more happening and much more investments coming in and don't and you should be you should be happy that last year we got 72 million 72 billion dollars of fdi 72 billion dollars that's not just small right sir. but i share a disappointment because we want india to do well you know we seen china we say why can't india be a china well indeed uh one other question related to the stimulus is there has been a lot of negative uh, assessment of the india stimulus package vis a vis compared to some of the other countries and the statistics says that it is about 10% of the gdp but it doesn't look like uh, like even it is close to even 1% how do you actually see the the facts behind the stimulus and whether it is actually what it is meant to be i think the stimulus is mostly on liquidity on the supply side on the fiscal side is only about 1.5% of gdp so it impact the budget only 1.5% and the rest i think is all stimulus liquidity uh, being etc and i think some other countries count uh, that some other countries don't count uk for instance has got a 300 billion dollars loan guarantee scheme where they guaranteeing loans to everybody uh, so i think you know we have to wait and see but the problem is india has got a big fiscal deficit so my belief is while america has announced big amount of money to be given to people for the salaries in the middle east they announced to be given to the salaries only for local citizens etc japan has given money to everybody people are giving money to everybody uh, the covid is not over so i think uh, modi is keeping some powder dry to see uh, you know uh, to see what to do later and he knows and realizes the indian can take a lot of pain the americans can't take the pain the indians can take a lot of pain i saw a video yesterday in new york that uh, somebody started giving out food food for people they were expecting 100 cars 1500 cars came and most of the car were mercedes benz a very big cars when they asked them hey you're coming in a big car don't you have food no we don't got no food whatever you earn will go to pay your emi emi for the car and for fuel we got no money for food but that is a different condition there that the rich country so i think we have to wait and see is very frustrating very painful people are angry and upset but i think we have to wait for a little bit to see what more happens because you know the fear is things would get worse right sir so this is an interesting question and uh, you know we look forward for a interesting response if uh, mohandas pai were the prime minister of india for a day what would be his top five or important measures he would take from medium to long term perspective to make india a growth story uh, for the world similar to what china has done in the last 3 4 decades 
okay the first thing i will do is to abolish long term capital gains tax <laughs> i tell you why see you may you may you may see you may you may, you may see I, i you you may you may say hey why are you doing this you know the stock market has come down by 45 lakh crores from march 1 till now and the wealth impact is gone you know we have three crore investors in sip last year they gave 1 lakh crore in sip the value is down people are feeling they lost their wealth they lost everything else now we got to get the animal spirit back if you abolish capital gains tax then i think there'll be a general improvement in the wealth that to be created in exchange people may feel more wealthy again and you know we all know what that impact is right and let me give you some data 1819 assessment year uh, all tax payers declared income of 45 lakh crores for tax 8 lakh 90000 crore of tax was collected but the income under long term capital gains for individuals are only 67000 crores only 67000 crores of 45 lakh crores so why have long term capital gains tax is a source of harassment and that will incentivize and i'll remove it for all assets gold land building everything okay and you all know as sir chartered accountants that once you remove the long term capital gains you got gold you sell the gold you'll reinvest yeah. you'll do many things else and that will create a spiral upwards well we could all say why is the market going up economy is bad but markets can lead to better economy better economy can lead to market so that i will do the second thing i will do is i will set up special groups in all the states with the central officer to go market india for the states because the states have to go on market because what india lacks is marketing we have everything else what india lacks is marketing and i will do that third thing i will do is i'll announce a very large infrastructure program just before the covid government has said we're going to spend 105 lakh crore of infrastructure so i will announce a very big infrastructure program for roads for ports for airports for metro etc and start giving money to contractors and start pushing the money but where is the money i will take money from rbi and 3 to 6 3 to 6 months later i will ask many companies and the financial institutions to go buy dollars dollar bonds in uh, in japan you know that japan has got negative interest rates and i will talk to the prime minister abe of japan and create a 500 billion dollar kitty to say we want to go borrow 500 billion dollars for the next uh, you know 5 years for 20 30 year loans and i will tell japan to give us some support in the in the case of changing some regulations to allow us to borrow and if you borrow 100 billion 200 billion dollars a year 20 30 year loans well first of all the people who take the loans may not be there 20 years later to repay that's a different issue all right <laughs> that money can be used to pump into infrastructure today because we have to spend it today and the best way to spend is to infrastructure to make india very very productive and the next thing i will do is to increase income support by maybe 1 or 2 lakh crores because today many of the migrants are suffering i'll give support to all the states to increase the income support and everything else and the last thing and the last thing i will do is to have you know special schemes to make sure that industry is incentivized to increase production and to and to make sure that uh, they can start investing again in many areas we suffering from a lack of investment so i will i will i will work on those policies and i'll try to see that mostly to improve the animal spirit and to improve the morale and to do things better because the middle class investing class feel that nothing has been done for them sir there is a rumor today in the social media that long term capital gains is being abolished so maybe what you are saying great. is probably being done oh really <laughs> i'm so happy yeah there is a rumor i, I mean i don't it. know <laughs> no i wrote about it uh, i wrote about it in two or three articles i tweeted on it to prime minister modi i spoke to people in the government that please abolish that because look it is only 67000 crores of income 12000 crores of tax but you know the hazards right and even for all of us if the abolish will be jumping up and down the joy let me give you sir india has 30000 tons of gold 30000 tons mm -hmm. at least 5000 tons can be sold right with with gold at such a high price many people who got gold will sell right they may buy property so i think we have to let loose cut off some of the things with inhibit people as soon as uh, you know your wish becomes a reality i'm going to inform my in-laws who have been holding on to their house property for a very long time to start selling it <laughs> uh sir in your presentation or your discussion you mentioned uh, india has a trade deficit with china now a question is can india actually stop this imports or put a curb on the import from china and give an encouragement to the indian manufacturing um, you know sector Uh, uh in in the current circumstances you know where everyone is trying to boycott china and chinese products 
Well, I think, um, I think, you know, Prime Minister Modi has tried to do that, though, you know, we have not been successful, but they have done something in the electronic area. You know, we were large importers of electronic and mobile phones. They increased the tariff and they got them to manufacture. Now, India is, 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 is got a manufacturing capacity of something like $30, $35 billion in uh, electronics, even though 70% is imported components, but the value addition is going to go up. So I would think that I will have a honest talk to China and tell them that, they look, this deficit is not sustainable if you don't import our agriculture products. India has surplus in cereals, rice, wheat. India has surplus in sugar. And India is surplus in milk. India has surplus in many soya beans. India has surplus in many things which China buys from the rest of the world. Why can't you buy from India? You know, we had a problem with Malaysia, remember, about seven yeah. things. And India cut the import of Malaysian palm oil. Palm and oil. now Malaysia is buying Indian rice. And now because of this uh, uh, cyclones in Bangladesh and other places, there's a shortage <clears> of rice. So Indian rice will get exported. So I would go to China and try to do a deal. And if China doesn't play ball in certain areas which is important to China, I will increase tariffs. Because today is a matter of my survival or somebody's survival. And I am at the price. If, if we are the ministers of the union government, our first loyalty is to India, right? We can open up later. So I will do it. I will do it. And there are many ways to do that. And I think India should have the hard conversation. President Trump has done it. Trump has done it. So I would examine, I would, I would do, I would do all that. I would look at all the imports from China and some of them, I'll take them off the ground because some of them you eliminate. Nothing is going to come happen to India. Right, sir. See, one of the questions that we have is about the reverse migration of people of the Indian diaspora outside of India. Now, uh, you know, there has been uh, mass, mass unemployment, of course, uh, in India, but also, you know, in the places that we are all working. And as uh, Anish mentioned, uh, you know, in the pre-recession, uh, a large number of people are, you know, in the process of migrating back to India, and the numbers are very high, as he mentioned, in UAE. So is the Indian government, um, uh, you know, uh, prepared to absorb this kind of, a, you know, reverse migration into the market, especially when, when there is also local unemployment? You know, and uh, what, what will be the fate of these people, you know, when they land up in India, uh, you know, and they find themselves, uh, you know, not immediately employable? Well, I think uh, the total number could be 10 lakh, 10 lakh people all over. You take all the Gulf and all, it could be 10 lakh yeah, people. Probably, yeah. And out 10 lakh people, maybe 5 to 6 lakh will be in Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> they could be in other states. So, I, I think, you know, in north of India, not many clerical staff or white collar people have got jobs in the Middle East. In the north of India, most of them are for labor, unskilled labor, etc. And I think the numbers are going to be solved so they can be absorbed because they come with skills. The problem is going to be acute in south of India, maybe in Kerala, maybe in Tamil Nadu, a little bit of Karnataka, a little bit of Andhra Pradesh. And I think the Kerala government has to really work on it. And the communist government in Kerala, I think, has to think about it. They're very worried right now. But I think if people go back to Kerala, they're going to be in some trouble. They have to look around to other cities to go and try to find some kind of jobs. Because, you know, many of these people have been in retail stores. Many of them people have been in uh, sales area, etc. And those areas are very saturated in India. And the wages are not very good. In the construction area, many of these workers coming back may get jobs because they're very productive. They're very disciplined. They're very productive. They use technology. In the professionals who are coming back, I think within three to six months, they can get jobs because they're very specialized and you know, they're very disciplined and they could get jobs. Of course, they may not get the same compensation. So I think there's going to be a period of worry for six months to a year. Six months to a year, you should have enough money to last. Hopefully your family support you or somebody will support you. And I think after that, I think things will become better. That's a but Kerala is the problem. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have a question for a, from a very prominent member of the fraternity, C.A. Mubin Khan, uh, who was the past chairman of uh, the Musket chapter. Uh, his question is, you know, India relies heavily on the remittances. Again, from an NRI's perspective, India relies heavily on the NRI remittances. And the last year, FDI to India was about 72 billion. Uh, and uh, remittances from NRI stood to approx about 80, uh, 80 billion dollars. Uh, why don't we talk about NRI's welfare as much as we talk about attracting FDIs? Don't you think it is prudent for the government to uh, allocate a budget for NRI's welfare and training when, when they're coming back? I totally agree with you because I think the NRIs have been working and sending remittances for the last many years and that's been helping India meet the balance of payment deficit because you have to pay for the oil. I agree with you. 
I do hope the government of India realizes and start increasing the budgets in the various states where the NRIs have to take care. And I think the NRIs in the Gulf and other places have to lobby the government of India. And let me tell you how serious the issue is. Most estimates, including the World Bank, says the remittances will come down by 25 billion this year. 25 billion dollars will come down. The only saving grace for India is the oil prices are down. Oh. So, since the oil prices have come down from 65 at coming to 35, may remain at 35, 40 for the rest of the year. You know, where India will not be deeply hurt because the oil price being down could be offset by this uh, remittances coming down for this year at least. Next year, we got to see what happens. Oil could come back a little bit next year. But, you know, the U.S. is always there, the swing producer. But I totally agree with you. The government of India should look at human capital and people as a great resource. The government of India should invest more in training people, sending them all around the world because we have labor surplus to work and get remittances. And when they come back to retrain them and have a bigger department to take care of them and, you know, create a welfare mechanism for them so that they can integrate back into society. And I think it has to be done because they're looking at the NRS as a mill stock. You know, we like you because you come and spend money. We like you because when we all go abroad, you come and listen to our speeches and do thalis and say, yeah, 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 how happy you are and all that. But when you are in trouble, okay, we'll see about it tomorrow. I think <laughs> I agree with you, Mr. Mohit. And I, I think it's totally, India has not been good to the NRS. And same thing I happened think, uh, when changes in the tax uh, yeah, rules. Tax now. too. They're not sensitive. They seem to think that NRS are a milk cow. NRS, <laughs> you know, 90% of NRS are really hardworking people who are trying to make ends meet and take care of the families. And they're struggling. They struggle. They work very hard. You know, it's true. So the government has to be slightly more sympathetic to them because, you know, they are full, they're, they're a very big part of the economy and they are enabling India to do well. I mean, 75 billion, 80 billion is not a small sum of money. Right, sir. So what's your view on uh, the dollar and INR uh, ratio in terms of uh, rates? You, know, you see... Yeah. Now, I will explain to you. See, today, the INR is about 75, 76, but we have got $490 billion of reserves. So $490 billion, and the dollar reserves have gone up from $440 billion uh, beginning of the year uh, to, four, I mean, from June of 2019 to $490, $50 billion in the last nine months. So what does it mean? Money is coming in, is accumulating as reserves, and the rupee has depreciated. So what have the RBI done? RBI has led the rupee to depreciate just to make sure that the FII sell and take the money out, they've got to pay a higher price. So RBI has played the smart game. So I think the rupee dollar will stabilize around 75, 76 for the next one year at least. Could appreciate a little bit more, but I don't think the RBI will allow that because uh, they want to pump liquidity into the market. And when they buy the dollars and pump money, interest rates come down. So I think it will stabilize around this range, maybe one or two dollars, one or two rupees this way, that way, depending upon the FIS selling in this country. And I do think that FIS and other investors come back to the market in the next two or three months, driven by huge surges of liquidity in the home markets. Right, sir. There is, there is a request from the participants that, you know, India uh, really lacks a public servant uh, like Pai, sir, and we would like to him to, you know, soon get onto the, you know, the political <laughs> field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is a technical uh, digital question, sir. I mean, you know, you're a big uh, advocate of digitalization. And there is a kind of a myth that the Arogya Setu app, which the government of India had introduced as a part of its efforts to monitor the, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, cases. Uh, there, are, there are some uh, issues in terms of privacy and data control. I mean, as, as someone who is a big, uh, you know, uh, supporter of uh, digitalization, have you assessed the Arogya Setu app and have you actually, do you stand by any of those, uh, you know, unforced, uh, you know, look, uncalled rumors, if there are? I, look, I, 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 I know the, I know some of the people who wrote that app and I do believe it's, it's perfectly safe and it's quite okay. And the criticism is coming from the same set of people who criticize Aadhaar, who criticize DPT and everything else for no other reason except ideology because they want to create a fear psychosis this will do. See, India cannot be a surveillance state. Government has no capacity to be a surveillance state. They lack the technological sophistication to be a surveillance state. We are not like China. China has got thousands and thousands of people who are doing surveillance. India has, the India government has no capacity. And most of the government officials don't even understand the technology, how it works. <laughs> They're very happy promoting that. <laughs> See, the problem with privacy is this. 
the government servants are not trained to keep the data confidential once they get the data they'll put it up on the web <laughs> just like your uh, data for your uh, voting you know your voting you right your election card details put it up on the web they're not supposed to do that they're not trained to understand what privacy is and etc and they're not sophisticated so i don't think that is a true thing and aragya setu i think is actually very good because today please remember we need an app to find out when you walk in the streets are there any people with covid symptoms floating around us in our office or anybody has got covid how will you know because we have to maintain a social distance we don't know and through that app we get a lot of uh, information 111 11 crore people are downloaded the app 11 crore people are downloaded the app voluntarily they're not been forced they've been downloading so i don't believe in this concern and the government has put the source code into the public area they have made it open source source code has been made open source but no government will do that if they were doing surveillance so i think much of the criticism is misdirected and i don't think it's true so last couple of questions one is again yeah. on technology yeah uh, uh, the government of india had uh, sent out request to the silicon valley to come out with an equivalent of a zoom and zoom was under severe criticism although we are still doing this webinar on zoom uh, how much uh, aware are you about the progress uh, of an equivalent uh, you know technology platform um, india is going to in india are we going to see no no they, look bharti has released a video app there are two or three small startups who have done that jio has promised to release a video app this is no great shakes this is no great technology people are not focused on that so it is not happen so i do believe that is uh, is already there in the marketplace it'll only grow bigger and the government is already got an app done by nic i was in a government seminar and we had a government app for uh, this kind of stuff so i think is is spread all around see the fear was that zoom had a server in china and everything was going to china now zoom has got a server in the us and i was told that uh, when you do zoom you can click whether you want the server in china don't want the server in china you can click so it will not be in china they put in safety features now and some of the holes have gone microsoft teams has come in webex has come in so there are many ordinate products india has also come out with products so i think the you know we have passed the date uh, we have got products now that's the last question is about the work from home culture uh, you did mention that about 20 to 25% of the population working population might be working from home uh, the question is should we expect work from home culture increase after this pandemic and how should we expect that expect that on the unemployment part well i don't think you know see work from home is essentially to make sure people become productive one of the things that happen is people have become more productive all it companies say people have become more productive it could be they are working harder and longer <laughs> okay it's not that they are working harder and longer because they are putting in more efforts also the commute everybody had a commute time of 2 or 3 hours so the commute is gone the commute is gone and you know uh, you probably you people may not understand that living in the middle east with the big roads and you know small cities etc here in bangalore it is a one and a half two hours each each way that is a lot is painful because traffic was stuck very bad traffic even in mumbai hyderabad every place so i think 25 30% happening uh, will will be positive for everybody it will not happen for the same people it will be by rotation that's what i believe uh, because you know people will take turns to do that uh, and i think is very good the only key thing which i am a little bit apprehensive is you know young people don't like work from home because young people who go to other cities stay in mm-hmm. small places 20% of them are staying are paying guests they get paid very little they are in a small room all by themselves and they don't want it because when you go to an office you can chit chat with everybody go for tea or coffee every half an hour or one hour you can gossip you can do many things now you can't do all that right because you're all uh, stuck up in your own place and you no know, so there's a camera there watching what you're doing all the time so there is a problem so i think it will be there for 25 30% but it but uh, but for the you know slightly older people it will impact them in a positive manner because now houses which are being built for about 60 lakhs 70 lakhs will have a home office so yeah. for the real estate people people will always say i want a bigger bigger home a, a room for my home office because i may have to spend time there and all the senior people whom i spoken to love it because they say look i don't have to commute you know i don't have children at home they're all gone away only my wife is there she is in another room i am in this room for example 
you know, I've got two houses simultaneously. I'm in one end, my wife is the other end. We meet for breakfast, lunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> mother, happy. so, you know, so I think for older people, it will impact for us. Younger people will have to come to office. So I think, but overall, I think it will be very good. I, I don't think it's going to create un more unemployment uh, because, you know, the number, see, India is a supply constrained country, supply constrained country. In a normal year, we can grow five to six, seven percent a year because, you know, we, has, we need so many more things. The supply constraint does not go away. We could be impacted for one year, one and a half years, then the growth will come back. So I think, you know, it's a positive. Right, Mahesh so, bhai, so I last think question. Sai has one question. Mahesh, uh, just uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to ask one question, CM Mohan Das Paiji. We met in Bahrain, I know, and this is another way of uh, interacting with you, thanks to the technology and uh, the COVID crisis. I would just like to ask, what's your view on the real estate sector? I think this is not covered. And do you think uh, the current format of the current education system will undergo change? Or will you see more digital online okay. schools yeah. and universities will also emerge? Yeah, let me start with real estate. I think the real estate sector is going through a shakeout. Only those companies who are well capitalized and who can actually got a brand will do well. Many, many small companies will close shut shop. They already close shop because you know people do one project, two projects are gone. And there's a huge supply about 40 months supply of residential stock all over the country. And about half of them are projects just stuck other way. So I think we need to have a large bailout, including rescheduling of loans and everything else. Government has not done that. They tried to do it before the budget. They've not done that. I think it's important. Second, I think in the next three to six months, uh, many real estate companies will start selling the stock. I heard in Bombay, they're giving 15, 20% discount and trying to get rid of the stock. Because unless they get rid of the stock, they will not have liquidity. They've been doing all along in the hope that prices will go up. Now they know the prices will not go up. And the banks also are turning the screws and saying, you're not going to get more money. You better sell. So we're going to see a decline. As it is, they're making side deals and doing all that and happening. So I think this will be for the good because we'll have better quality companies, better capitalized companies going forward. But we've got two years of pain. Two years of pain. And now interest rates are coming down. So I think there'll be a big, big boost to... Uh, boost to real estate because if interest rates come down, the EMI you have to pay comes down. And that EMI makes a lot of difference because most of the houses are bought with housing loans. If housing loans become much cheaper, for example, SBI is giving housing loans a 7.8% or 7.7%. I mean, earlier it was 9%. Now it's 7.7%. It may come down to 7% by the end of the year, looking at how things are going. And that I think will make a big impact. Now you spoke about education. You know, education has two components. I think in school education, most of the private schools will have offline, online education. So all the tech companies are jumping up and down with joy. The business has gone up. They're doing very well, almost all of them. And the schools too are adopting digital technology in a very big way. Some of the schools are hurt because government has told them don't collect fees. It's very silly how some government react. Don't collect fees because, you know, you're doing, uh, you know, uh, online education. But you have to pay the teachers. Where will the salaries money come to pay the salaries? They're not understanding all that. Kejriwal is saying, don't collect fees. Don't collect. You're doing online. He thinks it's free. Because, you know, government pays uh, uh, government servants from our, from our tax money, right? So I think everything is free. So uh, that will happen. And college education, uh, this year, the first semester may be online. We don't know when the colleges are going to open. There will be admissions, but they may all be online. I was speaking to the chairman of AICTE, and he's saying that, look, uh, we are, we are open to online for the first semester till about maybe January. You may you can admit students. And now for admission, all the tests are digital. You can do proctored examinations that are being allowed. Uh, they're saying that you can do online courses, 20%. It may go to 40%. So we're going to see a tremendous change in education driven by digitization in the next one year. So I think we're seeing the trend of online, offline education come, flip classroom, data being given. And they take companies that do well. So I think there'll be a quiet revolution. And in two or three years, very, very different thing. But uh, unlike America and other countries where the education sector is, is saturated, it's become very expensive. In India, only 26% of young people, 18 to 23, go to college. And I think that number is going up in future. And hopefully that should go up. But I think the cost of education may not rise in future because online, offline will make things cheaper. Thank you, sir. Uh, we had uh, we had a lot of questions on the NRI things, and you also agreed to some extent that the NRI's voice is not being heard. Uh, there was a follow-on question on that: that what is the best way to be heard? I mean, 
how do we reach out to the people and how do we ensure that things get really heard and there is some change done on that front you know let me tell you democracy is a system of competitive lobbies okay <laughs> in india we have a farmers lobby we have a farmers lobby we have a language <laughs> lobby we have a caste lobby we have a religious lobby we have all kind of lobbies so you have to keep your lobbying forces very well and our lobby and the political come, you got to the political leaders come to there you must not run behind them you must talk to them and say hey man this is what, this is what we are doing you must get data to say we are supporting so many families we are doing all this we are in pain we want you to one two three four five not ask for quicker visas and you know a pio and all that which you all got so you got to get a lobby strong lobby and stop running behind politicians and be frank with them and tell them you want all these things and make a charter of demands and i think uh, some of you must go meet uh, prime minister modi and have a talk with him because he <laughs> understand the power of the nri is travel round and i think uh, you, know, you got to have a lobby because you know democracy system of party lobby is nothing else nothing else right very good. listen to very the people who can make the most noise and impact them right and you have been too good to the political leaders you always uh, thank them go behind them give them uh, gifts and all kind of stuff now you got to tell them are bhaiya yes kuch karna hai maybe we might just get a reply saying that oh, oh yes but you don't pay any income taxes you know <laughs> no no but you know you see yes you must say that we don't pay income taxes because we are not uh, working here as citizens <laughs> we're not enjoying everything that you spend uh, but yeah. we support we support a lot of people so from your remittances you must calculate how many families are being supported in india what are the taxes being paid by the families out of the consumption and tell him this yeah. what we are supporting because in you know, the 80 billion dollars 80 billion dollars into 7 is about 6 lakh crores right you send yeah. 6 lakh crores if 6 if or 5 lakh crore is spent even if you take uh, gst at 18% that's 90000 crores that's not funny yes one of the past chairman of dubai says can we include you in the lobby of course <laughs> <laughs> So we can choose you as a leader in the lobby. <laughs> this is no, but, but that's true. We, we, we must not forget that democracy is a system of competitive lobbies. Absolutely. Okay. So there is one controversial question. Uh, I'm sure you know you are good in handling controversial questions, so that's why I'm taking the risk of asking. You know, uh, you know, a PM Care Fund was established specifically for raising funding for the purpose of COVID-19, and ICI, of course, has been one of the largest donors by putting in around 21 crores. and uh, we are thankful to all the members but there was a statement which said that it will not be subject to the audit of cag and it will be subject to some independent trustees or uh, you know someone doing the audit what do you what do you see that why was it not kept within the ambit of the control and auditor general of india's uh, you know uh, tax uh, uh, audit look i believe that if the fund is audited by chartered accountant anybody else is as good or better than the cnag audit okay So I don't believe that the CNAG is any superior to any child accountant, anybody else. That's point number one. Point number two, for me, the disclose what they have spent. I'm very happy. I think the culture was seven seven thousand five hundred crores. Three thousand crores has been committed. I think two thousand crores is being given to hospital for ventilators and everything else. And I think one thousand crore has been given to take care of the migrants in various states. I saw the newspaper item there. So long as the announcer is perfectly fine. You see, I don't think this money is going to be misused by anybody in Delhi. Look, Prime Minister Modi is the most honest Prime Minister we have had for a long time. Okay, he is a man whom you can believe and trust to make sure the taxpayers' money is properly used. All right, he will not allow anybody to put the finger into that Prime Minister thing. Okay, and he is very careful about his reputation. You may like him, you may dislike him, but there are some characteristics of the man which are very good. He is very careful about his thing, his reputation. so this will be used public in public welfare a uh, public welfare this is being done by some you know is the right question to ask but you know is being done in a political manner if citizens have said sir will you ensure transparency you would answer that but now is becoming political with all kind of people putting the finger right sir so uh, i think we have got so many questions but we don't have enough time and uh, we are very grateful for um, all the uh, answers that have given it's now our duty to extend uh, the vote of thanks i request uh, our senior member Uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, CA Mustaq Merchant Sir and uh, CSI yeah. Devita to convey the vote of thanks. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sri Mohan Daspai, thanks. Thanks very, very much. A very, very interesting session. No doubt about that. 
I mean, I, we all know your expertise in uh, across industries. I mean, you know, you know that globally and in India also. Uh, so I think this has been a very wonderful session. You have been very forthright and very frank in your views and you have told us about the pain and the gain that can be there for India in the next quarter or a couple of quarters. But I really hope that whatever you, your assessment of going forward will be good for our country. Yeah. Uh, thanks once, once again, Mr. Pai. And I, I don't know that we have been very lucky to perhaps listening to one of the, maybe the future PM of India today, you know. Yeah. So we, we really thank you for, all, for coming, uh, for giving this time to our, all the chapters. Also, a thanks to the GCC chapters over here who have collaborated for this event. Uh, Anish Ji from Dubai, I think, who was uh, looking after the, the webinar hosting and all that, and all, also the other uh, chairperson of the other chapter of the other uh, chapters. A special thank to Mahesh Kumar again, who has uh, in, uh, asked. Uh, I mean, who has invited our EP chapter? Who and we hope to return this, uh, you know, this particular favor to all of you guys in the very in the near future. Thanks very much, and uh, I think over to you, Sai now. Sai, are you there? Yes, I'm Hello. here. Actually, yes, yes, yes. You can hear me now. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate, sir. I think your last two hour session is equivalent to me, my entire age of, uh, you know, reading the newspapers and everything. I stop <laughs> reading the <laughs> following news channels and newspaper. I think this two hour session is more equivalent to rather than hearing all this. I think definitely we are highly privileged and fortunate to have you as a speaker. And many thanks to our CA Mahesh for taking the lead and collaborating with all our GCC chapter chairmen for making the event so successful. And uh, as well as thanks for taking out your big G schedule and interacting with our GCC chapters. Really appreciate. Thanks a lot. Folks, thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Good to talk to all of my old I, friends. I, I, I request uh, seeing you someday. I request Anish Mehta, of course, who has been uh, you know shouldering the logistical responsibilities because uh, you know there are a large number of participants. We had at one point in time about 400 plus participants who joined. I request see Anish, uh, Dubai chapter chairperson, to share his uh, views on the session and on and yeah. carry on the session. Mahesh by 400 is on Zoom and many others on the YouTube. Thank Around you. 150 plus. 150 plus are on the YouTube. On YouTube. So, sir, uh, thank you very much for your candid views and uh, very insightful information. Uh, as you rightly said, China's uh, uh, mark on the global uh, economy is reducing and it's the time where India can grab this opportunity. However, India has its own set of challenges. Uh, such as uh, employment and interest rates, etc. Uh, but uh, I think there should be a proper mix and balance, and that has to be thought of while making the new rules and policies. As far as the investments attraction from GCC, uh, we also talked earlier to our president also of the ICI. They have to look at the uh, uh, issuing the policies and set up a one-stop shop. And you also covered very well in your this thing that there will be one officer who should market India very well. So, and as one should be the concept which the state and central has to adopt and come together to really make it a new India where everyone can survive, prosper and grow. So at this point in time, I would like to conclude and thank you by reading some lines from an American writer, Mark Twain, which says, India is a cradle of human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of the history, the grandmother of legend and the great, great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most artistic materials in the history of men are treasured up in India only. With this, I would like to thank uh, Mundas Paisa, you and all the panelists and all the participants. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.